When playing Pandemic, have you ever wondered what might be going on whilst you're taking those flights? Well, wonder no more. Now we've got Pandemic Rapid Response to both answer that question and give us a whole new problem to deal with thanks to your inquisitiveness. I don't know why you can't just leave well enough alone. Well, I'm sorry, I was just wondering. If... It, it, it's fine, it's just we've already got enough going on without having to deal with this and all. Pandemic rapid response is you and up to three others attempting to create resources to distribute to cities in dire need of supplies during a humanitarian crisis. It also marks the 14th original entry in the Pandemic series, the first game to be played in real time, and the third installment that features no actual direct mention of diseases? Perhaps the series has just got sick of being sick. Gone is the globe you used to trot, replaced by the plane you do the trotting in. A plane technical enough for you to conjure up first aid, water, vaccines, food and power. But doesn't have an emergency exit, hold on a minute. But before you face the box by taking out the P word, there are some similarities between RR and its series namesake. You're dropping off aid to many of the cities featured in the original game. There's multiple roles with unique abilities that are key to winning, and there's plenty of cubes, even some nice rounded ones that you get to roll. These rollable cubes, or dice, are what power your machines that can develop supplies. Rolling results that match the room you're in allows you to store those dice in that room. Store enough, you can activate the room, generating the matching supplies. Once you're done, supplies find their way to the cargo bay where they can be thrown out to the cities that need them with one well-rolled die. Clear the borders of cities that need supplies, and you're cool. Yeah, done. Well, no, hang on a minute, it can't be that easy. You mentioned that this was played in real time earlier. Where does that come into play with this? Who let you back in? Okay, fine. I haven't been particularly smart at trying to hide this. But whilst your flight promises the latest in high-tech supply spewing McGuffery, you're under constant pressure from this antique-esque sand timer that'll be administering two-minute bursts of adrenaline every single round. When the first green falls, the active player rolls all their dice. They can spend a die of any result to move to an adjacent room, a plane result to move the vehicle close to a city in need of aid, or lock-in results rolled if they're in the right room. Once they've used all the dice they want, or re-rolled any dice twice and still aren't fond of what they have, the next player attempts to help. An emphasis on attempts here. What ensures that things aren't as clear-cut as matching shapes and pictures one by one is in most cases you'll have to apply an entire group of dice with the same result to progress in a stage. Trying to roll one very specific result with a diminishing number of dice is enough to make anyone look a little bit daft, let alone having to do a combo of three in just two rolls. How desperate are they for food again? Add to this the fact that if you lock in dice, they ain't moving until the room is activated. Focusing on one room by yourself may not be the best option if you're trying to reap heaps of cubes quickly, and being too energetic and slotting dice anywhere makes you a burden if poorly timed. If you have a petty amount of dice by the time your turn rocks around again, you're more used in the nap room than actually getting to work anywhere else. Oh, you don't want to overproduce supplies though, because you've only got 9 slots in your cargo bay to hold them. If you ever need to add anything else to it, something is going to have to go out the window to make room for it. And chucking supplies into the sea during a time of worldwide crisis? It's gonna need some bad PR. And there are downsides to creating supplies, because every time you do so, you generate waste. When a room is activated, the dice used to do so are rolled again to generate waste. If any circles show up, you up the waste track one per circle result. You can use dice to bin it permanently, but that takes up more precious time that, when it runs out, forces you to add more cities that need aid and chuck a time token in the garbage as well. You kick off with three of these, and you can get one back when you deliver supplies to a city, but if you don't have any time tokens left when you need to get rid of one, you lose. And if the waste track ever hits a number gas mask, it gets so stinky you've got to open some windows. And the resulting decompression tears the plane to pieces and you lose. Whew. So, it has everything a good real-time dice roller and co-op game needs. Opportunities to string together helpful actions with others in a bit to build combos that'll inevitably save the day. An underlying need to micromanage so you don't waste time and resources doing actions that no one actually needs to do. And enough twists and turns throughout the game to fill each round with tension. It even has multiple difficulties and an added deck of cards that cause additional dramas, needs and stresses for those that find even the toughest setting a piece of cake. No, not that cake. But where does this rank compared to the other pandemics? Oh, I don't bloody know. The one thing people always say to me whenever they play this is, oh, it's the best pandemic game that isn't a pandemic game. And you know what? Fair enough. Comparing this 
to these is ultimately meaningless thanks to the completely different mechanics. No, no, no. In order to get some form of analysis out of this, we need to ignore the series as a whole and go to designer Kane Klenko's premier dice rolling blow em up, Fuse. Fuse forces folks to take on a frankly ludicrous amount of bombs represented as cards, snatching dice from a collective pool to snip a way to safety. You slot dice in according to mathematical or color based rules, clearing a deck of bombs before 10 minutes is up and the living room goes up in smoke. It's simple and tight rules that guarantees you 10 minutes of tension every time you play it, and it's as dramatic as high stakes on a plane over here. And yet, it feels a whole lot less chaotic, and that bewildered me at first, because whilst Fuse is an onslaught of action that just doesn't stop, Rapid Response gives you breaks. When the timer runs out, you have a small interval of setup, lining up a new city in need and taking away a time token. You're not allowed to talk during this time, so you can't really strategize, but still, it's a breather and you can assess the situation. Despite the constant recesses, Pandemic Rapid Response feels like a more chaotic game, but not in a pulse-pounding, edge-of-your-seat kind of way, more of a slightly clumsy, slightly disjointed, curse these sausage-like fingers kind of way, and the more plays we got in of it, the more we realised that its issues don't stem from its original focus of time management, but more the design challenge that these games have when using their play area. In Fuse, while you're all working through a shared deck of bombs, you personally only get to handle two at a time that are placed directly in front of you, and this is nice. It means that whilst everything is breaking down around you, you have your own personal space for your own personal breakdown. You can only bump knuckles with others and mess up plans by grabbing a die from a shared pool. Grab what you need and you can get one step closer to defusing one of your bombs. If you leave any dice behind though, they can negatively affect the progress on everyone's bombs. When you enter this shared space, it's very hard to screw something up based on upkeep because there isn't really a lot of it or splay the dice absolutely everywhere because you're only going to grab one, but it's very easy to screw up on something baked into the mechanics. Communication. If you don't talk to everyone beforehand and just snatch everything you can, you're more likely to end up with a surplus of dice that'll screw everyone over. And communication would be a hell of a lot easier if you weren't under a flipping timer. Let's pick up the pace, shall we? Oh, the fuse app is so rude. Without meaning to sound like an overprotective parent, in rapid response, you're not encouraged to keep your hands to yourself as your dice are mingling around freely with others. The plane becomes an introvert's nightmare. You need to combine your dice together to get the best outcomes, but this can seem remarkably clumsy when it comes to doing the most important action in the game, activating a room for supplies. When you do this, the responsibility falls on the active player or everyone, depending on the level of turmoil occurring, to roll for waste, return dice to each relevant player, to move the waste marker up X amount of spaces, and of course, move the supplies generated into the cargo bay. Have you got all that? Is that a little bit of pressure for you? Don't care. Go off. Do your chores. Hurry up now. And if you're a new player, you're going to miss one of those steps, and if you're an experienced player, it's going to be hard to rectify that whilst under pressure without seeming a bit like an alpha gamer. On top of that, there's also the opportunity to knock your colleagues over and send them rolling around whilst in the syringe room and then returning components back to where you thought they were whilst you're playing the board like Twister. Um, don't play this with your feet, by the way. It's not very fun. And you might say that boisterously knocking into others and keeping the aisles garbage free despite the fact that's not what you originally signed up for is all part of the calamitous nature of the game. But since when has upkeep on Orion Air Flight ever been fun? And I'm not saying that games like this shouldn't have boards. Real Time Staple Escape has a modular temple that can consume an entire table with rooms that encourage you to split up almost immediately, only to come together again to generate crystals with your dice that'll help you get out. And if you knock anyone over, their flat faces means that they'll just stay put with a broken nose rather than roly-poly their way around. And it's not like Fuse doesn't have inelegant mechanics. In order to generate those dice pools, you have to draw as many dice as you have players from this bag blindly. But then you have to pass it to another player at the end of the round so they can do exactly the same. And it's just like, why can you not have a captain in charge of this one element so you don't have to faff around passing around one another? But it's a nuisance that's easy to stomach, partly because it takes place away from the table, but also because, well, if you're tossing your tool bag over to somebody else and you knock into a bomb, I mean, it makes sense that you look at that and go, yeah, okay, we're going to die now. <laughs> the seat oh, come on. These fumbling around for funsies or faff mechanics feel like Clanko's trying to have some fun away from the constant dice rolling. But in rapid response, there's so many of them in such a constrained space, it feels like they end up affecting the flow of the game. And yet, after every game we've played of this, win or lose, with experienced players or newcomers, Everyone wants to fire up another game 
immediately. In the case of a win, it's to tackle a higher difficulty setting, and in the case of a loss, people end up kind of beating themselves up over things, thinking they could have done a lot better, and I'm kind of sitting there going, well, it's not your fault things went wrong, it's not a dexterity game, and it is a bit weird that we have to do this constant cleanup whilst the game's going on, a bit high pressure, so you don't need to worry. Shut up, I want to play it again. Okay. It's easy to find flaws with anything. Hell, some would say it's a mandatory thing to do if you want to make it anywhere on this hell site, but what Rapid Response told me was not only a lot about time and space within board games, but these issues that I may have, how much do they really matter when they don't affect the overall enjoyment of the game for everyone else? I think this is murky territory for video games. I don't want a publisher using me as a defense for microtransactions going, no, see, people love them. It's fine when there's actually huge glaring issues, but it's made me look back on other board games I've played. The fat I believed I cut from them and actually gone, hang on a minute, what if I add those back in and see how they play now? I, I did it last week actually with uh, Mysterium. In the American version of Mysterium, players can vote on each other's guesses and all score points. They'll help them individually in the end game, but overall help the entire team win. And originally I didn't really like this. It made the experience that was Mysterium feel more like a game. But we played it so much that at our recent office games night, I went, you know what, let's just bring him back in, see how it plays. And it was a lot of fun. Ironically, though, none of the lessons I learned in rapid response convinced me to use Mysterium's sand timer, but everyone I know doesn't like it, so it's fine. Don't roll back. So yeah, if it was going for the peak perfection of performance to topple all other games, it failed. But I don't think Pandemic Rapid Response was going for dice rolling dominance. I think it was trying to help more newcomers try new things. Some might question why this is an official installment in the Pandemic franchise, and it's fair if you're a bit cynical about it, but I think it's to appeal to those not yet comfortable to dive into other genres of board games. Pandemic is such a flagship of the hobby now, it's almost impossible to avoid. And nowadays, when I talk to people about board games who aren't too familiar with them, instead of saying, ah, oh, yeah, I remember Monopoly, it's why I committed murder, why are you here again? I thought visiting owls were at five. Instead, they're saying that they got into a game of Pandemic and genuinely enjoyed it and avoided all felonies or at least the charges that come with them. The series is a beacon of dependable gaming, and if that can have reassurance to those who otherwise wouldn't dive into genres they thought they wouldn't be comfortable with, that's a great thing. And who knows, maybe right now, Klenko is working on the perfect real-time dice roller learning lessons from this. But for what it's worth, for all the elements I thought were issues with Pandemic Rapid Response, everyone else I have played it with has seen right through them and thoroughly enjoyed it. And that, for me, makes it a real high flyer. Oh because planes. Yeah, I got it. You were doing all right up until then. I think it's just... Get out.